In lab today, you got some data. Um, you rolled a BB down a tube and you looked at the position of the BB at uh, different clock readings as it rolled down the tube. And now I'm going to show you how to make a graph uh, using all of the important parts of a graph that you read about in the student guide to graphical analysis. So the first thing we're going to do, I've got a piece of graph paper. So the graph has to be done in graph paper. This particular piece has the grid done um, only on a small area of the paper instead of the whole thing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this entire gridded area as my axis. If you have graph paper that is completely covered in squares, then do kind of the same thing. Just leave a small area here uh, for writing your axis labels and units, um, but make the axes as large as you can on that piece of graph paper. I'm going to use a straight edge here to draw the axes, and you should too. Um, I'm using a red pen to do this because I think it'll show up better in the video. I'm not really sure. Uh, you should probably use a pencil. So once I've got my axis, I have to decide um, which data goes where. And you can see um, by convention on our data table, we've got the independent variable on the left, the dependent variable on the right. And so also by convention, our independent variable goes on the x-axis of the graph and our dependent variable goes on the y-axis of the graph. So I'm going to label both the quantity and the units on the um, x and y axis. So I've got clock reading. And in parentheses, I'll put the units, beats, and on the y-axis, we've got the position, and the units are centimeters. And I'm writing this out, but if you abbreviate it, that's fine too. Now we have to scale the graph, and um, to scale the graph, you really need to count the number of squares that you have. And so if I count this, I get 26 squares going this way, I get 40 squares going this way. And then if you look at your data, you can see that on my x-axis I need to get to 14 across those 40 squares, and I need to get to 110.5 centimeters across the 26 squares. So then what you do is, you just divide your maximum data value by the number of squares and if I take, on the y-axis, if I have uh, 26 squares, 110.5 centimeters divided by 26 squares, it gives me 4.25 centimeters for every square. And 4.25 is really difficult to count by because you get 4.25, 8.5, 12.0 point something, and then you stop. And so you need to round and um, round to a number that's easier to count by and you need to round up because if you don't round up if you round down then you're not going to reach 110 when you get to the top so we'll round up to the nearest easy counting number and our easy counting numbers are ones twos and fives and so since I've got 4.25 centimeters for every square if I round up the nearest number is five and I can count by fives so I'll have five there's ten twenty 30, 35, 40. And notice that um, each square on the way up is worth five, but I don't have to label every single one. That way it doesn't get too, too messy on your axis. But I am putting these little ticks here to show what my values are. You'll see that I get a little bit over the 110.5 that I need, but that's okay. A little over is fine. And you can see that it's taking up, you know, at least half of the axis here. It almost goes up all the way. Likewise, on the x-axis, I have 14 beats and there are 40 squares here. If I take 14 beats divided by 40 squares, I get 0 0.35 beats for every square. And uh, that's another number that's hard to count by. 0 0.35, 0 0.7, 1 point something, and then I'm done. And so what I'll do is I'll round up to the nearest easy number and the nearest easy number then, if you've got one, two, and five, you can have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.5. So I'm gonna count by 0 0.5 
and make every one of these squares worth 0.5 beats. So this is 0.5 and 1, and again, I'm just making tick marks to show the values I'm counting. I don't have to mark every single square, but you can see that every square is worth the same amount. And that's probably enough since I only got to 14 beats. And now it's time to plot points. When I plot points, um, I'm just going to use my data table here and I've got zero, zero. And see how when you put a point down, the point itself is actually very small and so you put a little circle or square or triangle around it, that's called a point protector and that's to let you kind of know where to start looking for that tiny little point. So one, six point nine. And once I've got all my points plotted, I can see that the general trend in my data is a line. And so I'll take my straight edge and I'll draw a line. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that line goes through zero. And then I'm gonna kind of try and draw a line so that I get about half the points on one side of the line and half the points on the other side of the line. I'm not sure how successful I'm gonna be here. So my best fit line is going to look something like this. And then on that line, I'm going to look for points that I'm going to use to calculate my slope. And what I usually do is try and find places where the line intersects uh, with these grid lines. You can see like right there is one and I'm going to mark that with a plus. So notice this is my data point here. I'm, you, don't use, you don't have to necessarily use your data points and you'll, you'll see why sometimes you shouldn't use your data points. Uh, because if you take a look at this data point, and these, these data points are actually not on the line of best fit. So you're trying to find, you know, there's an infinite number of points on this line. You're trying to find two points that are easy to find the values of and where the grid lines are, like, like right there. If, if these are grid lines, if I mark that with a little plus sign, you can see that this one goes right across to 110, and this one goes down to 14. Okay, and then I'll just find another similar point. I guess the easy point is I'm just going to go ahead and use zero. Zero is my point. <clears throat> and that's what I'll use for my slope calculation. Uh, the last thing I need to do is put a title on my graph. Uh, the convention for titles is always the y-axis variable versus the x-axis variable. And so for this graph, I'm going to call it position versus clock reading. for a BB rolling down a tube.
Now what I would do is I would take my second set of data and plot it on the same graph, maybe using a different colored pen or a different shaped point protector to uh, distinguish between the two. And then I'll have my graph position versus clock reading.